Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie, and man, oh man, am I so excited to have with me today, Mr. Howard Marks. Howard, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, Trey. Nice to be back. This is the first time you and I are getting a chance to chat, and I'm really looking forward to it, mainly because your last memo, I would call it a, a masterclass, honestly, on the macro environment. And it, it actually is a great amalgamation of a lot of topics we've been covering on the show and, and laid out in a very concise way, almost the most digestible format I've found for what's going on today. Nobody and... ever accused nobody ever accused me of being concise. <laughs> That's funny. Um, well, you are a longtime friend and fan of Warren Buffett, as are, you know, we're big fans as well. And you even began your recent memo with a quote from him, which states, for a piece of information to be desirable, it has to satisfy two criteria. It has to be important and it has to be knowable. So this explains the context behind a core tenet of Oak Tree, which states that macro is not critical to investing because it's not knowable. But with that said, I'm wondering if the macro landscape has become so distinct and unique, read as wacky maybe <laughs> to, per to previous cycles that you felt so compelled to cover it. Is that the reason? You know, I think that uh, I, I, uh, I turned Buffett's quote around in the memo later on to say that just because something is not knowable, that doesn't mean it's not important. And, and uh, so, look, I have an opinion on the future, uh, always, as do, you know, most of the people that I know, as does everybody at Oak Tree. But what we say at Oak Tree is that it's one thing to have an opinion, and it's something very different to believe you're right. So, you know, uh, a pine away, uh, but don't put too much confidence in it. You know, I, 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 in the last six, seven years, I've been addicted to Mark Twain's uh, statement that it, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for certain that just ain't true. Uh, if you, uh, no sentence that begins with, I don't know, but, or I could be wrong, but, ever got anybody into trouble. The sentences that get people into trouble are, I'm sure that, or I'm confident that, or there's no doubt that. And what I'm talking here, Trey, is about a mindset. And when you're in an area which is beset with uncertainty, variability, unpredictability, uh, randomness, uh, things like that, it, it just strikes to me as folly to be confident that you know the future. And you, I think it's, you know, the most important, one of the most important things in life for any walk of life is to be realistic. And I think that realism in investing includes not being too confident about what you think you know. Well, let's talk about another Mark Twain quote, which is history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And what I'm kind of curious to talk to you about, since you're such an expert on market cycles, and have written one of my favorite books on market cycles, there's always this hesitation to buy into the hype of a, of a bubble perhaps and say, this time is different. But what I'm really curious to know is, you know, in your letter, you state that since 2008, we haven't been operating in a free market. And so is this time truly different in your eyes of, of cycles? Well, I think, I think that this is a, a very different time. And in fact, the, the events of the last uh, year and a half vis-a-vis -vis COVID and the lockdown uh, and the stimulus, uh, an understanding of historic trends might be helpful, but none of these uh, events were what I would call cyclical. Uh, uh, cyclical events occur for reasons that are endemic, in, in, internal. Uh, 
uh, to the market. And uh, they usually have to do with uh, uh, excesses of optimism and then correction, which leads to excesses of pessimism and then correction. So, uh, you know, um, people think they know uh, that things are going to be very good, but then they incorporate too much optimism, which means that uh, they buy too much, they use too much leverage, they drop down in quality too much, uh, um, they bet more than they should, uh, etc. And it, when everybody does that, prices go too far on the upside to the point where they become precarious, and then they correct. And then uh, on the downside, you know, people uh, sell uh, short, uh, retreat to the sidelines, swear they're never going to take risk again. And eventually things go to excess on the downside. But because everybody has sworn off risk taking, uh, they don't get back in. Uh, and so, you know, what we're all in this business to do, uh, those of us who are active investors, is buy low and sell high. But everything in our nature conspires to make us buy high and sell low. And so it is, it is essential to, to, uh, to combat those instincts. And this, this event of the last year and a half was not a cycle. It wasn't born, I mean, the, the decline was not born out of excessive optimism and the recovery uh, was not merely a bounce back from excessive pessimism. The, this was like a, a meteor hitting the earth from outer space. Uh, the decline uh, wasn't the result of excessive optimism. It was a, this thing called a pandemic, uh, the coronavirus. and and. Uh, then the recovery was not merely a bounce back from excess of pessimism. It was the result of the greatest economic rescue effort in history, which worked. So I think that uh, there, are, there are relatively few uh, lessons about cycles to be gained from the last year and a half. Um, and, and I think that that the um, um, maybe the greatest lesson to be gained is that uh, you know it's hard to estimate fully the things that are going to happen. And by the way, one of the things that's worth noting is for those people who consider themselves uh, forecasters, who among us understood on March twenty third that from that date on, the market would march up in a straight line uh, to the point where it has now doubled from March 23rd, 2020 till today, August 21, the S&P 500 has doubled. Where are the people who thought that was the case? I certainly wouldn't be one of them. And you know, most of us uh, under participated in the rally. Now that's, a bit of an oxymoron because if we under participated, if everybody under participated, then how did the rally take place? Uh, but and that shows you the folly of generalizations. But the point is, this was not a normal cyclical event. It was something very different. I'm, I'm glad you bring that up, actually, because there's an old adage that you can't time the market, right? And JP Morgan did this study back in 2015, and it basically showed that by missing the best days in the market, which were essentially the days when the trend capitulated, it resulted in a massive difference in return. So for example, staying fully invested from 97 to 2016 resulted in an S&P return of 7.68%. Whereas by missing the 30 best days in the market that were usually after a quick correction of sorts, your return would actually have been negative 0.5%. So I know that Oakmark obviously has a tenant about not timing the market. So what I'm more curious about is how you balance 
positions based on the cycle versus simply just investing through all fluctuations? I think the answer, Trey, lies in the fact that while we invest through just about all situations, we, there have been times that we turned quite uh, reticent, that doesn't mean we behave equally through all situations. And sometimes we uh, become more aggressive and sometimes we become more defensive. And I think that's a, a good thing to do, although clearly it's not easy to do it right. And if we, uh, if we were to make the mistake that you just outlined and miss those 30 days, uh, you know, we would really have hurt our clients. Um, one thing I want to say before I move on is that it, in a way, the, the thing you posed is what we used to call in high school a trick question. Because, you know, uh, those of us who are attentive to the market cycle, and let's say you're good at, at doing it, would be less likely to be out of the market on those 30 days. You know, uh, what you're saying is after the market gets killed, it usually bounces back. And if you miss that bounce day, you're in trouble. Well, number one, if you miss the bounce day, you might have also missed the killing day. So they, they may offset. But you know, if you're a, if you're a good timer and sensitive to excesses and and able to weed them out, uh, you know, chances are you would not have dropped out of the market. Uh, uh, before the before the at, at the at the low ebb and missed the rally. Hopefully, That's a great point. A great call out to, yeah. to call yeah. it. You might have also missed the, de the initial decline. Well, exactly right. So you know, I mean, the, the, that's that's to me. Though I though we hear those things all the time. If you would have missed the best day, the best ten days, the best thirty days, but the, it, it, it's like fun with numbers. You know, uh, yes, if, but is it possible? I think I think the main the main import of your question is that the market is, does not perform smoothly and there are huge up days and also big down days. The up days, I think, tend to be bigger than the down days, but, uh, but it, the, 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 the function of the market setting the appropriate price for assets. It's not a smoothly operating one. Uh, and every once in a while, there's a, there's a big boom. Uh, and, and we shouldn't be surprised when that's the case. I guess I'm asking mainly because, you know, we recently had Jeremy Grantham on and he highlighted that, you know, although a lot of people were calling this market a bubble for a long time, we've, in his mind, we've only recently seen bubble activity Whereas before the pandemic hit, we were in this very slow growth. And as you highlighted, you know, the slowest growth since World War II. And, and so I'm just curious, I guess, if you're seeing similar bubble territory now in the, in the recent market days. And if so, if it's reminding you of, you know, say 2006, when you began quote unquote, planning for destruction of sorts when, when things weren't kind of operating right. Are you seeing any similarities to that time? Well, there, there certainly are similarities and they are the events that cause Jeremy and others to say bubble territory uh, and, and, to, and to blow the, the, the whistle of caution. Um, I think this concept of aggressive versus defensive is very important. You know, I go on TV every once in a while, mostly after I just finish writing a memo, and they're constantly trying to get me to say buy or sell, in or out. And in the last four or five years, I've, I've gotten away from that kind of talk. And now, the, the way I say it is this, and by the way, short answers, especially in the investment business, are usually a mistake because the concepts are complex and uh, not given to easy short answers. So what, 
rather than say buy or sell, what I say is this, every investor, especially everybody in your audience should have, in my opinion, a view of what their normal risk posture should be. And let's say we're talking about individuals. Let's say we're talking about you. How should you set your normal risk posture? And in my opinion, the answer is you look at your age, your income, your current earnings, the relationship between your current income and your needs, your, the amount of money that you have in the bank or in a portfolio, um, the number of dependents you have, uh, the, the, the level of your aspirations, and in, oh, and, and in particular, you have to make a judgment about your ability to live with volatility, mostly intestinal. Do you have the ability to ride out the ups and downs? Or are you likely to panic at the low and sell out, which is the worst wealth killer in history? Okay, so, so you, you, you think about all those things, you mesh them together, and, you, and I, the way I say it is from zero to 60. Zero is all cash, 60, is maximum risk, you know, plunging into uh, aggressive investments, maybe using leverage, zero to 100. Where should you be? You should probably be about uh, 75 or 80. I, you know, one thing is when you're older, if you think about the market cyclically, ups and downs, the, the, the younger you are, the more you can count on the long-term trend. And you have the freedom to, if you have the intestinal strength, you have the freedom to ignore the, the, the short-term ups and downs. The older you get, the long-term trend becomes a bit, of, uh, a, a bit academic and the short-term trends might make a bigger difference, especially people who are, for example, retirees, retiree uh, or uh, someone who's about to retire who has uh, just about enough money to retire and live shouldn't be investing aggressively anymore because while the trend line outlook for aggressive investments might be positive, they might come across some difficult periods which, in which their lives may be uh, thrown into a tailspin. And you know, one of my favorite sayings is never forget the man who was six feet tall, who drowned crossing the stream that was five feet deep on average. In, in our business, survival on average is irrelevant. You can't say, well, yes, he survived on average. You have to be able to survive on the bad days. And uh, you have to survive all the time. But the challenge, of course, comes on the bad days. And so anyway, the point is you come up with, 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 the, with the number and, and you say, Trey, okay, uh, I'm an 80. My next question is, will you change your risk posture from day to day or month to month, depending on what goes on in the market? Some people say, no, uh, Howard, I'm not gonna change. I, I, I'm in the position, I have a good portfolio, I'm gonna leave it alone. Some people say, yes, I'd like to change because when the market is too high, I'd like to cut back a little. And when the market is too low, I'd like to turn, uh, put more uh, oomph into my portfolio. So if you are interested in changing your posture as appropriate, then question number three, what about today? Today, do you think you should be more aggressive than your normal? or more defensive than your normal. And I think that that's a more useful uh, way to think about this than buy sell. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the years leading up to the pandemic, we never had 
a bubble warning. We never turned uh, highly defensive. Our motto was move forward, but with caution. Move, move forward, make investments. We were making investments every day. We were trying to be fully invested, but with caution. And since we're a, uh, since we're a firm that takes a cautious approach to our investments, with caution meant more caution than usual. And that's what we did. So we had a, we had a portfolio that was biased toward caution. Uh, for uh, several years, it didn't help because it turned out that the period uh, 09 through 19, for the most part, was a period when caution was your enemy and, and you know, aggressiveness was more helpful. Um, but anyway. Um, Quick question on more caution. When you say more caution, do you are you referring to more of a cash position or just smaller position sizes in general? How do you think about caution? That's a great question. Uh, and most people throw that term around without asking that question. I think there are three ways to increase your caution. Number one, go to cash in whole or in part. Very difficult because uh, num number one, it's a, it's a two decision action. You have to get out, but then you have to get in at a more propitious time or else it wasn't worth it. Charlie Munger says it's actually a three decision process because you have to get out, you have to get in, and while you're out, you have to figure out what to do with the money. So this, this is very difficult. And, and the other thing about, about you know, I, I try not to make decisions which are gonna be a disaster if things don't break your way. I think, I think one, of the, one of the important aspects of being a good investor is you try to set things up so that if things go your way, you do great. But if things don't go your way, you still do okay. When you were referring back to the idea of, you know, as you age, getting more defensive, that the typical routine or playbook for that would just be, you know, adding more and more to more allocation towards bonds. But given today's environment with the yields being so low and you're guaranteed to lo lose money right now on a real basis, is that really the best move as you're getting into your, you know, more defensive right. stage? Well, first of all, I, I should, let me finish what I was going to say about the Absolutely. three ways to be defensive. So the first way is to raise cash, but that's a real big problem because if you go to cash today and the market doesn't crap out for the next two years, it, it, let's say it goes up 12% a year. Two years from now, you're going to be behind the eight ball. You lost out on 24% of appreciation. You'll never make that back. So it, it, going to cash, problematic, we never do it. The second, change your asset allocation. So, you know, for example, we all know which asset classes are supposed to be uh, more defensive than others. Bonds are supposed to be more defensive than stocks. Big stocks are more defensive than small stocks. Uh, emerging markets are more uh, are less defensive than developed markets. The U.S. is more defensive than Europe, uh, etc. So you can move from aggressive assets into defensive assets. And the trouble with that is you have to really transform your portfolio. You have to do a lot of selling and a lot of buying. And if you're in funds, it's hard to get out and so forth. The third way of being defensive is the one I would suggest to most people. First of all, remember, uh, most people don't know when it's time to get in and out. So they shouldn't be doing uh, aggressive things. Uh, what they should do, in my opinion, is at the margin, you make changes in your portfolio that biases in a certain direction. So let's say you want to be more defensive. So one thing in every asset class, be it high yield bonds, stocks, uh, high grade bonds, anything, there are ways to be defensive and ways to be aggressive within the asset class. So for example, you say, well, I'm, I, wanna, I'm, I, I have a 30% uh, commitment to, uh, to uh, uh, let's say high yield bonds. There are high yield bond funds out there which make the most in the good times 
but you lose the most in the bad times. There are other high yield bond funds that lose the least in the bad times, but don't keep up in the good times. So you can switch managers within your high yield bond commitment, switching from aggressive managers to defensive managers. And that's the one that I think most people should look at. Uh, you know, most people are not, uh, it's, it's just hard to get it right to justify major changes in your portfolio based on hunches, which is what I think they are, hunches about, uh, about the macro. I'd like to tie back to the question right before that about as you, so as you're thinking about entering a more defensive age for the retail investor, and it was most commonly going to bonds, I'm just wondering how you're thinking about bonds. Ray Dalio recently said he'd rather own Bitcoin than a bond, yeah. uh, you know, because you're, you're guaranteed to lose on a real basis. Right. How are you thinking about bonds today? No, I think that's right. I think that, uh, well, first of all, it's in a way, it's easy to say no bonds. It's very tempting to say no bonds with yields where they are. But if you say no bonds, then you're, I mean, bonds are, in absolute terms, they are the safe asset class. And if you cut it, if you say, no, we're not going to have bonds, then how are you going to implement safety in your portfolio? So Ray is certainly right that, that, uh, that today's bonds are very unattractive. But you may want to have, I would think of bonds today, look, in, in this day, when, when the Fed funds rate is zero to a quarter percent, and the U.S. Treasury pays less than uh, the 10 year pays less than uh, one and a half and so forth. I would think of bonds of that type, safe bonds, kind of like cash. You know, uh, a, a way to store money safely from which you don't expect much. Nobody who invests in the bond market today is going to make much, but hopefully they'll make a little income and their position will be steady if, if, if interest rates don't go up much, um, which is an important caveat. But, um, you know, I, I sit on some uh, nonprofit uh, investment committees and, and have done over the years. And, you know, today I'm, I'm pretty emphatic that there is no place in your portfolio for uh, something like uh, an endowment. There's no place in that portfolio for securities whose only merit is that they're not going to go up and down much. Uh, you know, as you say, if you buy the 10 year treasury today, you guarantee yourself a, a, a return over 10 years of less than one and a half percent, which doesn't do much for anybody. Uh, and in, endowments typically need about 7% annual return to accomplish their philanthropic mission. And if you put many 1% bonds in the portfolio, it's going to make it awful hard to get to seven. And if you do so, and you still want the seven, that means with the rest of the money, you're going to have to do things that are extremely aggressive to try to offset the, the money that's invested at 1%. And that risk could, could bite you in the butt. So um, uh, I think that uh, certainly Ray is right. In most portfolios today, there's no place uh, for safe bonds. I'm tempted to ask, I know you've been spending a lot of time with your son, Andrew, over the last year through the pandemic and talking a lot about Bitcoin. Any thoughts on that working its way into a portfolio at a time like this? Look, I... I came out very strongly against Bitcoin in 2017 when it was, which, which was the first time when it entered our consciousness. Uh, it's been around for, it probably had been around for seven or eight years before that, but that's the year that it went from one to 20 and everybody started uh, 1000 to 20,000. And that's the year that everybody started talking about it. And I came out very negative because I said, there's nothing behind it. It doesn't produce any cash flow or any return uh, in, in, intrinsically. Uh, the only return you're going to get in Bitcoin is by selling it to somebody for a price higher than you paid. But you can't value it. You can't say what is the 
fair intrinsic value of a Bitcoin and it doesn't produce cash flow. So I was very, I, I was extremely negative. I was extremely outspoken. And uh, as you say, I spent a good deal of the pandemic living with Andrew and his family. And we had to hash out some of these things because he's on the other side. The first thing I was uh, informed of by him is, and I accept this, is that at that time, and even today, I don't know enough to have a strong opinion about Bitcoin. Over, over the course of my life, I've been uh, quite a skeptic. I've been successful in being skeptical of uh, financial innovations, uh, but that doesn't mean that all financial innovations are, are, are not worth it. And so my, I think that my reaction was a knee jerk reaction to something new. And now I prefer to say, I don't know enough about it to have a strong opinion. Uh, Andrew says to me, you know, and Andrew does own it. And obviously it's been a very good investment. Um, and fortunately he owns it for me because he manages money for our family. Uh, but he says to me, dad, are you ready to admit that I was right? So I said, well, let's put it this way. I'm less emphatic that you were wrong. Uh, but, you know, uh, I mean, it, it, Bitcoin's been around now for a dozen years. Uh, and uh, so it, it, it's, it, if it's a flash in the pan, it's an awful long pan. Uh, maybe, maybe something's there. And, you know, what I, what I missed in 2017, looking for intrinsic value and, and cash flow production, I missed the supply demand case. The supply demand case is that the software limits the issuance of Bitcoin or the creation of Bitcoin to 21, I think 21 and a half million. Uh, whereas uh, the demand can grow for a long time. People who live in places where you can't get to a bank, where you don't trust the banks, where you don't trust the government, where you don't trust the currency, um, uh, a, a lot of these people are going to maybe turn to cryptocurrency. Uh, the other thing is that uh, there's a big argument that it's, they call it uh, digital gold, that it has some of the qualities of gold in the sense of being uh, inflation resistant and maybe crisis resistant, but relative to gold, it has advantages, which is you don't have to pay to store it. You, you don't, it's not challenging to send it someplace or move, move it around and you can spend it, which you can't do with gold. So those are the arguments in favor of Bitcoin. And uh, certainly uh, in 2017, I wasn't familiar with them. And the people who bought Bitcoin, let's say a year and a half or two years ago, uh, have, have made a lot of money. Now, uh, we'll see, it, we're probably not, finished learning all there is to learn about Bitcoin. And we'll see in the future whether it turns out to be a legit asset class and holds value. But it, as, the, as the years go by, it gets harder to say, it, you know, there's nothing to it. Well, and I, I asked because after reading your latest memo, and while you do say you don't understand enough of maybe about the technology, you certainly understand. I mean, you lay out the perfect you, a case for Bitcoin, in my opinion, on mm -hmm. On your letter for the macro from the macro sense and one of the other points i wanted to talk about that you've referred to recently is stems back to the cost of capital and i'm wondering how you think through that given that manipulated may be too strong a word but that certainly seems to be the case um, and i'm wondering how you think about the discount rates today and what what you're using, I guess, you know, in comparison to the interest rates I have. Um, great question. Not, not, a, not an easy one. But, you know, uh, I did say in the latest memo that we haven't had a free market in money for at least 12 years. And, and what I mean by that is that I'm sure that everybody who's an investor has to believe in the free market system. You know, probably, we probably don't have many socialists or communists investing in, in our stock market. Um, but uh, if you believe in the free market, 
a lot of your belief is that in a free market, assets flow to their, what we call their highest and best use. And um, so uh, the, 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 the free market does a very good job of allocating resources. You know, uh, nobody's gonna work in job B if they can make much more money in job A. And the reason they can make more money in job A is because job A is working on a better product, which faces more demand, more people want it. So, uh, so there should be, uh, so uh, a, 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 job, a, a product A company is more valuable and workers will go to work there. So the, the resources migrate to their best use. And, and normally the, the free market does a good job of incorporating considerations of, of, of risk and return. And in, when you're operating in the free market, a lot of people say, well, on the one hand, I'd like to make a lot of money by doing X, Y, Z. But on the other hand, I might lose money by doing X, Y, Z. So I'm going to only put it in a moderate amount or I'm not going to do it or I'm going to hedge it or something like that. But uh, so that's how, that's how the, the free market kind of incorporates intelligence. We don't have a free market in money. The, the, the interest rate on certainly short-term funds for ever since the global financial crisis of 09 has been set by the government. And most people would argue that today's interest rate is lower than it should be. And because we have a, a lower interest rate than might be appropriate, what does it mean? It means that borrowers are subsidized, lenders are penalized. People who want to use lev leverage is encouraged, savings is discouraged. Savers, pensioners are penalized at the expense of borrowers and risk takers. So, um, you know, uh, we, the, look, the Fed's job is to manipulate the economy. And those manipulations have, have a, let's say a price because they take money away from where it would naturally end up and they put it someplace where it naturally wouldn't end up, but they make it happen. So um, you asked how we think about rates. An asset value is in academic terms, but it turns out that it often works in the real world. It's the discounted present value of the future cash flows. And so you, 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 if, if you, if you're a savant and if you can see the future, or if you're an analyst trying to do a good job, you lay out the cash flows from that investment year by year for the next X years, as far as you think you can see. And maybe you have a probability distribution, maybe you have a central point and a range of high and low, but you, you, you lay out the future. And then you discount those cash flows back to the present to come up with the present value. What does it mean to discount it? Well, if, 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 uh, if the interest rate today is uh, 7% and you're gonna get money in 10 years, then that money is worth half today uh, what it will be in 10 years. So you come up with a, with a present figure for what the future cash flows are worth. And the lower, the rate at which you discount, the higher the present value of those cash flows. So, so the, the level of the interest rate you use in your analysis figures importantly in setting the price. Um, and, uh, but the answer is uh, today, and to, so today you could use a discount rate of 3%. And if you find something that's going to pay off in 10 years and you discount it back to the present at 3% and you buy it, you think you're doing a good thing, but maybe that means you make 3% a year, which isn't a very good return. 
So you have to discount at an interest rate, which is an attractive rate of return to you. We can't, you can't succumb to using today's interest rates. One of the things I said in the memo is that most assets appear to me to be fairly priced today, given the low level of interest rates. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I just went through the way interest rates affect valuations. Um, and today we have the lowest interest rates in history. That would simplistically argue for the highest asset valuations in history. But if you buy at the highest asset valuations in history, there's lots of ways things can go wrong in the future. Like interest rates go up, people demand higher returns. That means t t tomorrow's values are not worth as much today. That means prices go down. You know, uh, one of the ways, one of the reasons the market has done so very well over the last 17 months is that by taking the Fed funds rate to essentially zero, the, the Fed has, well, people say, well, I don't want zero. High yield bonds look great at four. When the Fed funds rate was, was three, nobody thought high yield bonds were great at 4% yields. Uh, they said, no, I want nine. But today with the Fed funds rate at zero, they say, oh, that's, that 4% looks pretty attractive. Everything, all judgments in investing are relative judgments. Uh, Sid Cottle, who was the editor of Graham and Dodd and Cottle, Graham and Dodd is the Bible of, uh, it's called Security Analysis, their book, it's the Bible of our profession, although a little, uh, a little antiquated. Uh, Sid Cottle was the editor of the later editions, uh, like the one I read in college. And Sid was a consultant to me at Citibank, and he said back around the early 70s, investment is the discipline of relative selection. All the, all the decisions we make as investors are relative decisions. I think that based on return and based on the ratio of return to risk, I think this is better than that. So we buy this and we don't buy that, or we buy this and we sell that. That's the way we make our decisions. And today we're making relative decisions between two different assets, perhaps, relative to interest rates. And we have to understand that that if interest rates change, everything else changes. Uh, and so the biggest mistake you could make today would be to discount at an ultra low discount rate because rates are low today. That's uh, a, it's a good way to get into trouble. In some way, you have to try to insist on a, a good absolute return. You have to insist on what we call margin of safety. That's what permits you to do okay if things go against you. But it's, it's hard in a low interest rate environment. You know, we're living in a, what I call a low return world. And it's hard to make, for, the, for all the reasons I've been discussing, it's very hard to make a good return in a low return world. Um, and an endowment that needs seven can't, most endowments, uh, pension funds, insurance, et cetera, with fixed obligations, have concluded that they can't make the return they need in the stock and bond markets. So they move to what are called alternative investments, which means private equity, hedge funds, stressed debt, real estate, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but that they go there to try to get the returns they can't get safely in stocks and bonds, but that introduces other risks, illiquidity, leverage, manage your risk, you know, you back the wrong horse. Uh, so the point is <clears throat> there, there is no safe and dependable way to get a high return in a low return world. Think about it. There can't be, you know, I mean, one of the most important things that every investor has to learn is that at some point in time, they may have to say, no, that's too good to be true. And if I say to you, Trey, I have found a way to make a high return with say with certainty today, you have to say, no, Howard, that's too good to be true because the world would not permit that to exist. You know, if somebody comes into your office tray and says, you know, I've been managing money for 30 years. I've never had a down month. I've made 11% a year. I've never had a down month. Your job is to say, 
that's too good to be true, Mr. Madoff. And the reason Madoff uh, got away with it for so long and, and hurt so many people so badly is that when people think they're making money, they never say, but is it, it, does it make sense that it's so easy to make money safely? And it, it, it like can't be. So I think that reasonable expectations are one of the most important uh, things for any of us investors. Well, I'm glad you brought up security analysis because it's, it touches on the point of how important price is. Mm. And, and while you're saying that prices are appropriate relative to interest rates today, one of my favorite Buffett quotes is price is what you pay, value is what you get. Um, I'm curious on a couple of things around price and value. One is, well, let's just start with what is your earliest memory that taught you the importance of price? And then I want to kind of lead into maybe where we go from there. Sure. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote that great book, Outliers, who talked about the importance of what he calls demographic luck, what you and I might call right time, right place. And I was lucky in a perverse way uh, because I started my career as a, uh, in the investment management business in 1969 at Citibank as a security analyst. And, and the, in those days, the banks were, did most of the investing. There were no boutiques uh, and there were, no, there were very few firms like, like Oak Tree or, 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 or uh, you know, the firms that are on everybody's lips today. It was the banks. And most of the banks, what we called the money center banks, that's the banks in New York and Chicago and Boston and places like that. Most of the money center banks invested in what were called the Nifty 50. And these were the 50 best and fastest growing companies in America, companies that were considered so good that nothing could ever go wrong. And because they were so good and nothing could ever go wrong, that meant there was no price too high. And if you look in the index of my uh, recent book, uh, Mastering the Market Cycle, under no price too high, you'll find, see there are lots, lots of citations because that's, we talked before about a bubble. That's one of the greatest indications of a bubble. If, 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 if investors can think of an asset class and, and say, oh, you know what, for that, there's no price too high. That's a bubble because by definition, it's irrational. For everything, there's a low price, a fair price, and a price too high. Anyway, so the banks invested in the Nifty 50. That certainly included Citibank. We were one of the great leaders. That meant uh, uh, IBM, Xerox, Kodak, Polaroid, Merck. Lilly, uh, Hewlett Packard, Texas Instruments, Perkin Elmer, Avon, Coca-Cola, and on like that. The great, great, great companies. And if you would have invested in those companies the day I started work in September of 69 and held them for five years diligently, you would have lost almost all your money investing in the best companies in America. Why? Because people ignored price. And so they didn't get enough value to use Warren's terminology. And the answer is that price matters a great deal. And the shorter your time horizon is, the more it matters. The shorter your time horizon is, the more important it is that you're not overpaying. Um, so anyway, the, the, the Nifty 50 were selling at PE ratios. Today, the average PE ratio is in the low 20s. P.E. ratios between 60 and 90 in those days. And, and, and for the most part, those P.E. ratios have never been seen again. And then five years later, the P.E. ratios were between eight and nine. And that's a good way to lose 90% of your money, which most people did. Um, so that taught me an important lesson. And uh, I, I, I concluded at the time, it's not what you buy, it's what you pay for it that, that really matters. Then I was very fortunate. The break of my life came in 1978 when I was assigned to the bond department. I wanted to get into money management. My reign as director of research at Citibank involved as it was with the Nifty 50 was not so successful. So they said, I said, I want to manage money. They said, okay, we'll put you in the bond department, start a convertible bond fund, which I found very interesting. It was a backwater that nobody else was looking at. And then in August of 78, 
I got the call that changed my life from the head of the bond department. He said, there's some guy out in California named Milken or something, and he deals in something called high yield bonds. Can you figure out what that means? Because a client had come in and they said, we want a high yield bond fund. So, uh, so now I'm investing in the worst public companies in America and I'm making money safely and steadily. Whereas investing in the best companies in America had been really dangerous. So then I concluded that good investing is not a matter of buying good things, but buying things well. And if you don't know the difference, then you shouldn't be uh, doing much investing. Uh, so, you know, that, that brush with the Nifty 50 taught me the importance of paying a fair price. And, and uh, the, the real lesson is that there are no assets which are so good that they can't become overpriced and dangerous. And there are few assets which are so bad which that at the right price, they can't be bargains. You know, one of the things that Oak Tree has done for the last 33 years with great success is investing in the debt of bankrupt or likely to be bankrupt companies. We call it distressed debt investing. And you might say, but Howard, how can you invest in the, in the debt of bankrupt companies? You know you're not going to get repaid. And the answer is that a, if you buy the debt of a bankrupt company or soon to be bankrupt company, it embodies, it, it gives you a claim on the value of the company as a creditor. If you buy it cheap enough, that may be you're, you're paying a price for that claim, which is so low that it's gonna have a great return. And that's what we try to do. So I think that uh, price is extremely important. And as I said, in bubbles, basically what it means is they ignore price and that's a terrible thing to do. A big difference between the late 60s and now, it seems, is the, the IP involved. Um, because, you know, I'm seeing similarities now, especially with the, the FANG stocks and companies that are leading the S&P 500, that I start to worry about those who are big time indexers. And I'm wondering if you see similar risk. These companies seemingly have no top because it seems almost impossible to put a price on their IP. So do you look at you know, the fact that the S&P 500 is market weighted as a potential risk to a lot of retail investors? Yeah, great question. Very relevant question. Uh, you know, in every market cycle, we get to the point where people say, you know what, this thing, whatever it is, whether it's the nifty 50, uh, 50 years ago, or, or uh, internet 20 years ago, or, you know, uh, tulip bulbs several hundred years ago. They get to the point where they say, well, this is, this is now, it's, it's risen to the point where it's a sure thing. This, is, this can't, can't lose. Uh, why not? Well, for example, you look at the, at, the, at, the, at the tech or the fangs. They're in the S&P heavily. Every time a dollar flows into, say, an S&P index fund, or even an active manager who kind of secretly uh, closet indexes, money is going to flow into these names predominantly because they are so heavily weighted in the index, which means that money has to keep flowing in, which means that they have to keep doing better, which means that they'll never falter, which means that it, they're a sure thing. Well, there are no sure things and there's, there's nothing that can't falter. My dad used to tell the story about the guy who was the uh, uh, habitual gambler and every week he would go to the track and lose all his money. So, one day he heard about a race with only one horse. So he went out to the track and he put all his money down and halfway around the track, the horse jumped over the fence and ran away. The point is there are no sure things. And if you, this goes back to the Mark Twain. If you find something that you think is a sure thing and you bet disproportionately on it because it's a certainty, 
and it turns out not to be a certainty, that's how you lose a lot of money. And um, so uh, you, can, you can construct this account for the fangs that I just described about how the money has to keep flowing into them and it's kind of self-perpetuating. And when I was little, we used to talk about perpetual motion machines, which is a, a machine that can run forever with no fuel because it generates its own energy. They've never come up with one yet. There was a cartoonist named Rube Goldberg who used to design those. And we used to talk about Rube Goldberg devices. But the truth is there is no perpetual motion machine. There's nothing that goes on forever. And the, the way to lose a lot of money is to buy something on the presumption that it is a perpetual motion machine and then, and then have a reawakening. Um, I think that the, and you know, by the way, the, the magic is off some of the fangs this year. They're not necessarily having great years. Stock markets, s and is up 18%. Many of them are, are, are underperforming and Andrew would say that one year doesn't matter. But, but um, the thing is that I believe that if, if, the, if the market goes like this and you have some asset, be it, a, let's say it's a fang and it keeps going like this, if one asset outperforms the others long enough you have to flip it over. The, the, if you flip over, outperform, what you find underneath is becoming more expensive. That's what outperformance is. So if, if asset A outperforms B, which is to say does, appreciates more than B long enough, disproportionate to the merits, eventually it will become overpriced. And if it's overpriced, it is, it, it is then likely to run into some hiccups and, and, and a correction. So I just don't think that one asset can outperform all the others forever. And, and investors who hear that siren song of, of uh, permanent outperformance are in trouble if they succumb. I want to touch on corporate debt as you did earlier, because it seems like that game is shifting a little bit as well. The Fed now holds nearly 14 billion in corporate bonds themselves. How does the Fed's recent involvement into these markets affect your personal, you know, or Oak Tree's rather investing playbook? Um, the most important thing about that, uh, Trey, is what it did in the recent past you know we were we were expecting something uh, 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 you know a massive recession something approaching a global depression if the central banks hadn't come to the rescue and uh in the first half of uh 2020 we raised a the largest fund in history for distressed debt investing, um, $15 billion. And the previous record was our 08 fund, which was $11 billion. And we were, you know, we started to invest that, uh, that money and, and, uh, and so forth. And, and in March and April, there were great, great bargains to be had. Then uh, the Fed came in, cutting interest rates, giving out grants and loans, and uh, starting to buy some corporate debt which they had never done before. The Fed had never bought corporate debt before. And the main effect of that was that it precluded the kind of meltdown that we had expected to occur and that we had expected to take advantage of. Uh, but that's in the past now. Um, and uh, they got, there were, there were lots of companies that would not have gotten through uh, the pandemic uh, in one piece, but they got through because the Fed kept loading them up with money, making more money available to them and, and, and buying their bonds. Uh, anyway, um, you know, we're value investors. I don't know if the Fed's going to keep buying. By the way, it, it, the 14 billion they bought is something, but it's not a huge amount of money 
bond mar- in bond market terms. And you know, I assume they're 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 probably done buying corporate bonds now. It's it's a very radical thing for the Fed to do, and they've probably done all they want to do for a while. Um, but um, you know, we kind of like you you said that one of the tenets of Oak Tree's investment philosophy is we don't let market uh, macro forecasts influence our investment decision. We don't say, well, let's see, should we buy that bond? Will the Fed be buying that bond uh, on Thursday or not? You know, that kind of thing. Or will they be cutting interest rates or raising it? We just look at, we, we look at, a, at, at an asset. We say, we think we can get a return of X percent under normal circumstances. And we think that X percent is a good return given the level of risk in that company. And so we make that decision kind of on an internal basis the company, the risks, and the possible return without making guesses about what's going to happen in the environment. It's just too damn hard to get to get that in that environment part right. All right. Well, I want to be mindful of your time, but I do have one seemingly unfair question left, which uh, I'm borrowing from Tony Robbins' book, Money Master the Game, where he essentially asked Ray Dalio, if he could package together a portfolio for his grandkids that they couldn't touch for say 30 years, yeah. what allocations would kind of make up a portfolio like that? I, I'm just posing the same question to you because I'm just incredibly sure. curious. Sure. This is, this is what I want to say to your uh, listeners, Trey. The most important thing is to start an investment program while you're young Continue it as you grow and don't screw it up. That's my, that's my most important recommendation. How do you screw it up? You tamper with it too much. And of course, as I mentioned some time ago, the biggest screw up you can do is to sell out at the bottom. And so most people are not really suited for getting in and out of the market. And I, 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 I said that I think that it's, if that's how you're going to practice defense, it's very problematic. If you look at the stock market, the stock market has returned about 10% a year for the last 90 years. And uh, if, you, if you can make 10% a year, and if you can avoid paying any taxes, so don't sell, your money will double every seven years. Money compounds at 10% a year, it doubles in seven years. So let's say your grandchildren are five and they're gonna, they're gonna live to, to, uh, to 75. You got a 70 year program ahead of them. That means if you can do 10% a year and not pay taxes, both of which are his heroic assumptions, that it's gonna double 10 times. So you put in a dollar today, the kid is five, right? Uh, Two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1,024. A dollar deposited when the kid is five will be $1,000. 70 years from now. Just don't screw that up. Don't get in the way of of, of the compounding machine. You know, uh, I think it was Mark Twain, maybe um, Albert Einstein, uh, Einstein said, the greatest invention in history is compound interest. Just get out of the way. Don't screw it up. So so I think that, uh, and by the way, my grandchildren, should probably be at about 95 or 100 on my risk return dial from zero to 100. Why? Because they have their whole lives ahead of them and their parents and their grandpa is probably gonna backstop them anyway. So they, they, should, they should invest early, probably all in the stock market. You don't have to get fancy you know, with, with, with other things. They, and, and so uh, that, what, and by the way, 
that means index funds, really, an S and P index fund, a Russell two thousand index funds. You know, you want to you want to get a, maybe a, a, a emerging market fund. Uh, you want to you might want to have some exposure to the emerging markets, to smaller companies, certainly to China, which is probably going to be look before those grandchildren become adults, China will be the biggest economy in the world. So you wanna have exposure to China and perhaps the other emerging markets. So I think my advice is a variety of equity index funds, which complement and round out each other and then leave it alone. You know, they, they, when, when, uh, when automation uh, began to make great inroads into employment as they did in the, as it did in the in the aughts and especially the teens, uh, they used to talk about the factory of the future. In the factory of the future, there's one man and one dog. The dog's job is to keep the man from touching the machinery, and the man's job is to feed the dog. It's the same with the grandchildren. My job is to is to create a portfolio for them and keep them from putting their hands on it. Uh, and I think that, that that I think that that is a formula which is sure to work in the long run. And anything you do in the short run to try to outthink the market is probably going to reduce your likelihood of achieving your long run, run goals. Well, I love the simplicity in that. And you mentioned Einstein. So there's another quote attributed to him that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. That's and right. But simple doesn't always equal easy. And, and no. what you're highlighting there is how hard that can be. To, yeah. The temptations are sometimes too yeah. great. So I think it's very wise and, and really great advice. Howard, this has been an incredible honor. And I, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show and, and providing all this wisdom for our audience. Um, it's a huge amount of value you've shared with us. And you've been very generous with your time. Well, so, thank you for your interest in my ideas. And thank you for sharing them with your listeners. I hope they're helpful. Well, I hope we can do it again sometime soon. Absolutely. Stay Thanks. healthy, stay safe. Cheers. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.